it is uh, it is good to be in the Lord's house today. Amen. I'm glad the storms were yesterday and not today because it'd just be me and Terry and Jesus here uh, <laughs> today. Uh, but I'm glad my family is here and uh, some of our kids that have grown up in this church and gone through college and now are off uh, making a difference for the Lord or have come back for today and uh, John Irwin uh, surprised me this morning who was uh, I first met on the set of Courageous running the the uh, second unit and then uh, was privileged to be a part of the Woodlawn movie with them about revival and racial reconciliation and he flew in from Nashville last night. I don't know how you got into Albany last night. There must have been a cargo plane or something that you hopped in the back of. But um, for my girls to be here and for Drew to be here, for you to be here, uh, for this day is, is very special to me. Um, I'm going to preach all 2,000 sermons that uh, <laughs> I, I have preached here. Because uh, some of you missed some of them, uh, and so I want to make sure you get them. Uh, I want to ask you to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, as we conclude this series on the Christ-centered life, and I want to speak to you for a few moments this morning on consecrated Lord to thee. Consecrated Lord to thee. This is a sad and glad kind of day for me. It's sad because I will miss this. But I'm glad because God's not done with uh, us as a family or with you as a church. And I, I'm grateful for what God has ahead. You know, God never panics in heaven. He just doesn't. There's nothing that catches him by surprise. He doesn't panic. He didn't run around and called an emergency angel meeting when Paul was decapitated. He didn't you know, fall apart at the pieces when the disciples were being martyred, when Stephen was being martyred. The church marches on. And as long as God leaves us here on this earth, he has a purpose and he has a plan. And his purpose and his plan is through the people called the church. It's not the buildings, it's the people. And uh, what makes this church great is the people that are here. God has allowed us to build some great things, but it's the people that have made uh, Sherwood what it is. And as I uh, said in an interview a number of years ago uh, with USA Today, and they were asking about the movies, I, I can't even remember now which movie it was, uh, but uh, I said, you know, God did a pretty big thing in a little town called Bethlehem. And because of your prayers, because of your commitment, because of your faithfulness, because of your sacrifice, because of your serving, there are a lot of people in this world that know about Albany, Georgia, Amen. that would not have known about this church otherwise. But it's because of you and your willingness to take a risk and to follow some crazy pastor and some crazy staff that believe that God could do something more than just Sunday school and church and that we could have a bigger footprint in this world. Uh, that's why we are who we are today. And can I tell you, God does not want to go backwards. He wants to go forward. Somebody's going to be here that's going to have a vision for the next 20 or 30 years. And I can't wait to see, God willing, what that looks like. Now, I know you're all in Romans chapter 12. You either knew where it was or you found it in the index in the front. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that... You may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. In, in these two verses, they're, they're like a hinge. They're a hinge between what all he has said, Paul has said in the first 11 chapters of Romans and what he's about to say. He's told us what we should know 
doctrinally, what we should believe, how we should believe. And now he's going to tell us what we should do about what we know. And so chapter 12 begins this transition and sets up the rest of the book. In chapter 12, he talks about our individual responsibility to the will of God, to live out the will of God. In chapter 13, he talks about our societal responsibility, how we're to act and live in the society in which we live. And no matter how bad you think our society is, we do not live under a Roman dictator and an oppressive government that killed people at a whim. We are still blessed to live in a land of freedom. We have societal responsibilities. In Romans 14, our fraternal responsibilities, accepting brothers and sisters in Christ. The standard is not what's on the outside, the standard's what's on the inside. In Romans 15, our universal responsibilities of evangelism and missions. Paul wants us to clearly understand that Christianity is a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christianity is a life. It is the life of Christ in us. That person in us through the Holy Spirit that empowers us to live a consecrated life and to live above the fray and to stand out in a world that is falling apart. The therefore in chapter 12 and verse 1 looks all the way back through the first 11 chapters. This divine revelation and motivation to do what Paul has written about, this Magna Carta of our faith. He talks about, in the first 11 chapters, the sinfulness of man, and that man is ruined by sin, that apart from God coming and giving his son to die for our sins, we're without hope. We can't do enough good works. We can't save ourselves. We can't be good enough. We can't join enough churches. We can't be baptized enough times to save ourselves. It's all by the grace of God. It's all by the grace of God. And then he talks about the salvation comes through Christ. Salvation does not come by good works. It comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God has provided a way of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. And all that he does in those first 11 chapters is tell us about salvation and then sanctification, how God wants us to live in light of being saved. Our relationship to God is built on consecrated bodies, on renewed minds, on giving God our hearts and then our bodies. And we need to remember a word here that can, I think we can quickly pass over. Brethren, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Now, Paul is writing to a church in Rome, in a pagan city, full of Jews and Gentiles. And you know that everybody is a Gentile that's not a Jew. So it doesn't matter what race you come from, what part of the world you come from. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. That's the big picture of God. And he knew that different cultures and the diversity of people coming together could issue problems and opportunities, but it was the will of God that the church be one body. Not a group over here, not a group over there, not a group over here, but that the church be one. And that when we look at each other, we look at each other as brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. We don't look on the outside because none of us had anything to do with how we look on the outside. We look on the inside because we all bleed red. And so Paul says this word brethren, he's trying to address the tension that happened in every church in the first century of division, uncertainty, distrust, different customs, different ways of thinking, but they had to all come together in one church and to be used by God. John Stott says that this choice of this word brethren is deliberate. Look at what Stott says. Now all believers 
irrespective of their ethnic origin, are brothers and sisters to the one international family of God. And so all have precisely the same vocation to be holy, committed, humble, loving, and conscientious people of God. So he calls us, first of all, to consecration. I urge you, I beseech you. This is a call not just from the Apostle Paul. This is a call based on the call of God. I beseech you, I, I, I urge you, I appeal to you. It, it's not a suggestion. It's saying this is how we need to live if we are God's children. If we understand what God has done for us, this is how we need to live. This is not an argument, it's not a lecture, it's an appeal that Jesus wants our attention and he wants our surrender. Paul is using a verb form of the noun for the Holy Spirit, pericoleo. It carries the idea of standing alongside someone and giving counsel or hope or perspective. We are called to stand alongside one another in this battle of life. We're not called to abandon each other. We're called to stand alongside each other, to come alongside. I urge you, I appeal to you to come alongside those who hurt. That's what Paul is saying. To those who don't understand, come alongside them. To those who are upset, come alongside them. He's urging them to act like Jesus in a world that wants to act in the flesh and to give people the benefit of the doubt and call them to a higher purpose of their faith in Jesus Christ. This is urging something that looks like what God expects of us. God expects this of his children. You as parents, you, you expect certain things of your children. You hope, you pray, you expect. Well, God expects certain things of his children. He sent his son to die for us so that we could model and look like the children of a holy God and of a loving heavenly father. Secondly, there's the basis of consecration by the mercies of God. Paul is specifically calling to mind the message of the mercies of God that he's been dealing with over and over and over again in Romans 1 through 11. In fact, when Paul thought about the mercies of God, you think about this. This is a guy who was the religious guy of religious guys. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He had an edict from the chief Pharisees to go out and kill Christians, and God met him on the road to Damascus and struck him down and said, Paul, why do you persecute me? And then Ananias came and saw him and took the blindness away from him and said he was going to have to suffer many things. But Paul realized that a man who should have been judged and left in judgment, God had shown him mercy. Our culture, our world, drives at us to judge everybody and show mercy to nobody. Our culture and our world drives us apart. We separate instead of coming together. And so Paul looks at these mercies that have been poured out on him, that, that, that God had saved him, that God had spared him over and over on these missionary trips. I mean, half of us would have said, if this is what it means to go be a missionary, if this is what it means to serve God, Lord, I volunteer somebody else. I don't want to be the spokesperson. I don't want to plant the church. I don't want to do that. But Paul gets so excited about the mercies of God that he gets to the end of chapter 11, he says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. You see, the more we understand what Christ has done for us, the more willing we are to consecrate ourselves to him and to give our all to him. When I think about when I dwell on, when I receive, when I embrace and accept the mercies of God, they're like a magnet 
that draw me to God. I don't have a father that I am afraid of. I have a, I have a heavenly father that I am attracted to because of his mercies, because I can come boldly before the throne of grace, because I can enter into his presence with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. I, I have a father who waited for me when I was in my own pig pens and watched for me when I came home and embraced me and gave me a ring and put a robe on me and killed a fatted calf and threw a party and angels rejoiced when I was saved. That's the father I have. That's a magnet. That is what the gospel does. It draws people who feel like they've been rejected and will always be rejected. It draws them into the presence of a loving heavenly father. The old hymn of Isaac Watts says, Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. It's a call to the Christ life to die to the self-life, to what I want and what I feel and what I think and what I think I deserve. And it's a call to the Christ life. Can I tell you something? All of us have been blessed more than we deserve. All of us have received more mercy than we deserve. None of us should ever shake our fist at God and say, God, how could you in light of all the things he's done and we'll get to heaven one day and find out all the things he spared us from. And all the time that he moved in our midst, that we weren't even totally aware of it at the moment. And so Paul is building out of the mercies of God. If you turn back a few pages to Romans chapter 4 and verse 7. Romans 4 and verse 7. By the way, I love the sound of that. <laughs> uh, don't ever lose that. Romans 4, 7, blessed are those whose deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin in the Lord, sin the Lord will not take into account. Amen? Amen. Romans 5, verses 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? May it never be. The third thing is the way of consecration. How, how do we get to this? Paul says, present your bodies. Present your bodies. Now, in Romans 6, Paul says we shouldn't go on presenting our bodies to sin, but now he says we present our bodies to God, and to present is a technical term. It's a sacrificial term. It's a temple term of bringing something and putting it on the altar. Just like the Jews in the Old Testament would bring their sacrifices, their first fruits, their animals, their unblemished animals, and put them on the altar. The key was the sacrifice had to be without blemish and without defect. And he says we are to present ourselves. Now that's an aorist tense in the Greek. I just thought I'd throw a little Greek at you in this last message. Uh, that's an aorist tense, meaning it's set once and for all. Present yourself once and for all to God. His sacrifice for us once and for all means that I once and for all make a decision that I'm going to follow Jesus. Now I'm going to have hiccups on the way. I'm going to have speed bumps on the way. Somebody's going to sit at the light when the turn signal is on and they're just going to sit there because they're texting on their phone and about five seconds later, you're going to lose your Christianity. <laughs> and somebody is going to be in a drive through line because you can't go in and order and sit down. And they, they can't make up their mind. Do I want a medium drink or a large drink? A large drink or an extra large drink? Do I want, do I want tea or do I want Coke? 
Do I want grilled or do I want fried? I don't know. Wait a minute. Let me change that order. And then you're going to sit there and say, we, we're not just going to eat chicken today. We're going to get you today for taking time in this line. Uh, I, I went somewhere the other day and they said, do you know what you want? I said, yes. <laughs> I already know what I want. Can I pass? Is there a passing lane? Can I get around these people? I mean, I'm a man in a hurry. I'm a man of God. <laughs> you got to let me get by. <laughs> you see, we, we, it doesn't have to be repeated, but because we tend to slip, it must be constantly reaffirmed. That's why I have to get up and give myself to the Lord every day. I have to die daily. I, I have to take up the cross daily because although it is a once for all presenting myself, when I put myself on the altar, I know I have a tendency to crawl off. So I have to remind myself to get back on the altar and present myself a living sacrifice. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. This world says, I can do whatever I want to do. The believer says, I will do whatever God wants me to do. I will go where he wants me to go. I will give what he wants me to give. I will serve how he wants me to serve. I'm available to God to live out the Christ life, the Christ-centered life in this world that is so selfish that when we live that out, the world wonders why we're so different because they just think about themselves. Uh, I, I said this doing youth camps for years and, you know, kids would come up to me and say, well, I, I don't think... I don't think these people like me. I don't think those kids like me. I don't think this group likes me. You know, it's just the way they look at me at the locker. It's the way they look at me at the table at school. It's the way, it's the way they look at me. And I'd say, they're not looking at you. They're so obsessed with the, what they think you're looking at them. And they're worried about themselves. They're not worried about you. They're worried about themselves. Do they like me? Do they like me? I hope they like me. And all of y'all are sitting there having the same thoughts and not talking to each other. You might find you like each other if you just break down the barrier of worried about yourself and start being conscious of being like Jesus. And reach for the ones that the world doesn't want to reach for. The life we live is to be an expression of the life of Christ, not just in moments, but our entire being. Jesus gave his life for us. We are to give our lives for him. Look at what he says. We're a living sacrifice. This is in contrast to the old covenant offerings of a sacrifice had to be slain. This is a call for a daily, living, deliberate, ongoing sacrifice again and again because left to ourselves, we want to live for ourselves. We don't want to die to self. We just want to live for ourselves. And we can't do that and please God. This offering is not made in a temple. This offering is made in our homes, in our schools, at work, in what we do and where we go and how we live. It's made in the daily grind and crunch of life. That when life squeezes us, what comes out of us looks like Jesus. And when it doesn't, then the first thing I know is I need to get back on the altar. And I need to die to myself. Because I don't have to have my way. I need to have God's way. It doesn't have to be about me. It has to be about Him. Because when I'm gone one day... And in glory, God's not going to ask me, well, Michael, what do you want to do today? How do you want me to run heaven today? Boy, can you imagine if there, if there are many, many Baptists, I didn't say any, I said if there are many Baptists in heaven, can you imagine how many people are going to think that they can go to the throne of God and say, 
uh, we'd like to have a committee meeting. And God will lean over and say, you know, I tried that one time. I sent a committee into the promised land and a million plus people died because they wouldn't believe the promises of God. I quit doing committees after that. You ever notice that when the disciples selected somebody to replace Judas, we never hear from that guy again? God didn't tell them to select somebody to take the place of Judas. God already had in mind who was going to take the place of Judas. That was Paul. And they ran ahead of God. You know why? Because they just thought they needed to do something. Rest in the Lord. Rest in the Lord. A living sacrifice, holy, undefiled offering, willingly following Christ without reservation or hesitation. Jesus first and last and everything in between. Not playing around the edges. Acceptable. A well-pleasing sacrifice that honors the Lord, that, that it pleases God for us to do this. Can I tell you, worship's not acceptable if it's compartmentalized. If it's just something we do on occasion on Sundays, it's, it's not acceptable worship because what we do is worship. And what you do is worship. I, I don't care what you do, what your vocation is. It should be an act of worship. Nobody helped me understand this better than Ron Dunn when somebody said to him one time, well, I'm just a housewife. Don't ever just say, I'm just a housewife. Especially if you got kids running all around you. Don't ever say I'm just a housewife. Uh, I won't. I'll, I'll stop right there. But. <laughs> Ron said, let me tell you what your spiritual, spiritual act of worship is. He says it means that you can wash dishes to the glory of God. While you're sitting there washing dishes, you can praise God that you have the hands to wash dishes, the appetite to eat, the, the resources to provide for your family. He said, you can have worship washing dishes. You can have worship cutting your yard. You can have worship doing your job, your career, your vocation. can be a living sacrifice and act of worship. Jesus asked nothing of us that he has not done himself. Lord, this is too hard. You're asking too much. He's, he's not asking anything of us he has not done himself. General William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said, God has had all there was of me. J. Wilbur Chapman said, The greatness of a man's power is the measure of his surrender. Now, the result of consecration is found in the last of verse 1 and in verse 2, which is your spiritual service of worship. We just talked about that. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. It's reasonable. It's spiritual. One commentator says the necessity of this rite of consecration follows from all the argument about the mercies of God. It's spiritual. It's reasonable. Let me tell you another way you can translate that. It's logical. It makes sense, sanctified sense in light of what God has done for us. It makes sanctified sense to live this kind of life in light of the mercies of God, to be consistent. It's logical. You understand all that Christ has done for you. It means that you don't want to be half-hearted or, or hot or cold or on and off and up and down. You, it's spiritually sensible to live this way. Sam Shoemaker said, to be a Christian means to give as much of myself as I can to as much of Jesus Christ as I know. To give as much of myself as I can to as much of Jesus Christ as I know. Do not be conformed to this world. Literally, do not be conformed to this age, to the way that this world thinks. God has another way of us thinking 
about how life should function, how families should function, how churches could fu function, how businesses should function. He has a, he has a better way. You know, I, through, through decades of being in ministry, I, I've had people say to me at times, so, you know, you, 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 just can't, you just can't bring your Christianity into your business. And I said, uh, you ever heard of Truett Cathy? Chick-fil-A makes more per store closed one day a week than McDonald's does. And McDonald's has got a gazillion more. I mean, you can find a McDonald's at the edge of a garbage dump. I mean, you can, you can find, you know, Happy Meals, yeah. kids' toys. In fact, we have 13 landfills in Albany just on kids' toys. <laughs> no, you can operate your business, and God, can, God will bless your business when you bless him. When you treat your employees and your employers like God wants them to be treated, then God will bless your business. God will bless your home. God will bless your efforts. It doesn't mean that that you're going to become a multimillionaire like Truett Cathy was. It does mean that God's going to bless you in ways that you cannot even begin to imagine as you make yourself available to him. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, that kind of consecration leads to transformation. You see it in the nation of Israel to be distinct from all other nations, you see it in the exclusivity of the gospel. It's not Jesus plus anything else. You see it in the Sermon on the Mount. You see it in the fruit of the Spirit. You see it in Paul's letters to all the churches about how they are to act in this godless world in which we live. Hudson Taylor said, All God's giants have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned on God being with them. The verbs in these verses are present passive imperative, speaking of continuing attitudes. My favorite paraphrase of verse 2 is J.B. Phillips. Do not let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within. I was sitting between severe thunderstorm watches <laughs> yesterday and uh, trying to find the flashlights just in case the power went out. And, and uh, a, a song came. This happens to me sometimes. Uh, just a song came to me that, honest to goodness, I probably haven't sung this song in at least 50 years. Uh, but I mean the words just just came to mind. In the 1991 Baptist hymnal, it's number 571. You can Google it. This, this is the song. While passing through this world of sin and others your life shall view, be clean and pure without within. Let others see Jesus in you. Let others see Jesus in you. Let others see Jesus in you. Keep telling the story. Be faithful and true. Let others see Jesus in you. I'm just part of the second verse. Your life's a book before their eyes. They're reading it through and through. Do others see Jesus in you? That's my prayer for you, is that others would see Jesus in you. That when they think about you, they would think that person's a lot like Jesus. That's my hope for you, that others see Jesus in you. 
That's my longing for this church, that others would see Jesus in you. That's my prayer for the next pastor, that when he steps into this pulpit, that he would see Jesus in you. And that you would give him the same support, the same prayers, the same encouragement, the same prayer cards that you've given us through all these years. I've seen Jesus in so many of you. And that is what makes Sherwood special. It is not our buildings. It's the people who love Jesus. We're not a perfect church. But we're a mighty good one because people see Jesus in us. I cannot tell you through 31 years how many times somebody has sent me a note, written me a letter, sent me a text, posted on Facebook, and said something to this effect. When I walked on that campus, I sensed the presence of God. May it forever continue until Jesus returns. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that uh, you have been pleased with our worship today and with the word today. I pray as I stand here and remember what I stand on, this platform written 20 years ago, let him who stand here and preach not Jesus be accursed. Lord, I thank you for a church with listening ears and obedient feet and serving hands. I thank you we'll get to do this one more time tonight and look at your word one more time about what you want us to be moving forward in this season of transition. I pray that if someone is here today and they haven't trusted Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, that they will have heard enough about Jesus, seen enough about Jesus, that today would be the day of salvation. That in a moment when we break from this place, that uh, they will go out to that next steps desk and talk to somebody about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. I pray for those who feel they've blown it, who wonder if they can restore and redeem the land which the locusts have eaten, that you would plant new fertile seed in their hearts and in their minds. I pray for those that have given up, that have succumbed to guilt and a sense of being overwhelmed or a sense of self-pity or an attitude of defeat, that today would be the day that they, right where they are, put themselves on the altar and give their yes to you. Lord, you're a good father. It's just who you are. You're a loving father. You're a waiting father. And Lord, you look for us to respond to the overwhelming mercies that you have poured out on our lives. I thank you for the privilege of worshiping you today. I 
pray that it has been pleasing to you, honoring to you, glorifying to your son, Jesus. And in a moment when we leave and when the praise team sings us out, we have entered your courts with praise. May we leave your courts with thanksgiving. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ken? I'm thankful for a pastor that preaches the word and leads us in prayer. Amen. 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 Just a few announcements. If this today is your first time here, we want to say thank you and we welcome you to Sherwood Baptist Church. We're so grateful that you're here. Church family, are we glad our guests are here this morning? Amen. That's right. Also, if you're looking forward to the next step, where do I go from here? I've heard the message. My heart wants to respond to the message of Jesus Christ. Where do I go from here? We have a next step desk that's out in the atrium. We would love to meet you there and tell you about a new or renewed relationship in Jesus Christ. So please meet us at the, the uh, Next Step desk out in the atrium. Now today, as all of you know, is a sad day, but it's also a special day. So on your way out, you will receive a commemorative bulletin of today's events for this morning. And then also, just like our pastor mentioned, tonight will be his last sermon as a senior pastor of Sherwood Baptist Church. I'm praying this won't be his last time here. It won't be his last time here but this will be his last sermon. So we invite you to come back and worship with us tonight. It'll be a very special night for family. Amen. We're family. Amen. 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 Look around you. Look at all the different people around you. Look at all the ethnicities, backgrounds. God did all this for a reason. Amen. And we're so grateful for it. And so we want to see you back here tonight for House of Prayer, and then also for the service. God bless you, and we'll see you then.